opera is so famous, and of course Mozart's music is amazing. It's one of those pieces of music that's just always been around me. I chose to eliminate the vocals uh, in order to eliminate the connection to words. There's something very unique about conducting an opera not having any singers, and so we're, we're relying on the dancing and the choreography to tell the story, and I think Cleveland's done a remarkable job trying to tell a story non-verbally through this uh, glorious music. My name is Peter Bay, and I will be conducting the Austin Symphony in the Pit for this production of The Magic Flute. My name is Donald Grantham, and I'm the orchestrator, or the reorchestrator of the uh, Magic Flute. Did you have a difficult time selecting which solo instruments would replace the singers? I'd never really noticed this, but in going through the whole score, I could see that Mozart was very careful in using a specific subset of the orchestra for every single part of it. And by doing that, he conserved his timbres so that they were very fresh when they turned up. He wasn't using everything just kind of randomly. This particular version of Magic Flute, which Don has wonderfully transcribed for no voices, now uh, offers individuals in the orchestra an opportunity to be soloists, because there is no singing. The, the trombone, the trumpet, the flute, the oboe, the clarinet has a chance to be a star for an aria, instead of uh, the queen of the night, let's say, who would be a stratosphere like soprano. We have a piccolo trumpet. And so each of the individual instruments that are featured in solos will have to sort of take on a vocal role and know what they're singing about, quote unquote. It's a unique opportunity to hear a very well known and beloved opera in a completely different light. Given the nature of the set, it's black and white, shadows are all gray, and sort of a very neutral color palette. The costume design had to bring some life because ultimately the Magic Flute is a comedy. And so I engaged with Susan Branch Town and I thought that she might bring a real whimsy to this production. The ladies in waiting. As far as those ladies are concerned, Susan hand painted all of the lightning strikes on their costumes. It was nice to have her hands on in the shop throughout the build process. She also hand painted the Queen of the Night and she personally set about 4,000 jewels on all of the fish scales on that skirt. The bird design by Susan Branch, the tutu skirt was in this teardrop shape. So I contacted Class Act up in Seattle, a tutu company that I work with frequently. And she created these teardrop shaped tutus for me. She sent me the bases. So just the basic skirt, the basic top, and then I was in charge of embellishing them. It involved many, many feathers and yards and yards and yards of feathery yarn and different fabrics, which I shredded and clipped to look feather-like. And even to this day, uh, if we move the cutting table, we still find magic flute bird feathers under there. I think the most rewarding thing about that build and probably the most rewarding thing in general about what we get to do in the costume shop is when you finally get to opening night and you had started four or five weeks ago with things that were just mountains of materials on a cutting table and to finally see that come to life on stage is pretty magical. One of the things that's most unique about this production of the Magic Flute is the use of, of shadow puppetry. So we found Shadow Light, a company out of San Francisco. They spent about two weeks here with us, developing what the shadows would be and teaching our crew how to manipulate them. And it was the opening of a world that I had not thought about, and it was very interesting. Stephen came to me with the idea that he wanted this to work with shadow puppetry. It's so perfectly suited for this type project. It's perfectly suited for dance and for the magic flute in and of itself, just because of the sense of mystery that the piece has. I had to make sure that the shadow puppets fit into our environment as a whole for the dance and for the design. 
Sometimes if you use shadow puppetry and you have a lot of three-dimensional things around it, it can make them look very flat. So I made sure that this entire design felt as though it were also cutouts and layers of shadows. And it makes the shadows feel at home because the shadows become the fourth layers of the same type of cutouts. We brought the dancers to our warehouse where we had set up all the lighting instruments and the backdrop that the shadows would be reflected onto. And then we just experimented. And kind of playing a lot with perspective. If we play with perspective, if we play with angles, if we play with body, you know, what's gonna show off more of the face? Obviously profile reads a lot more than front, but what gestures work and what don't. And that was a really fun process. It was a great deal of fun. And, you know, you felt like a kid. And we've all done that, right? We've all played with light, you know, when we're children in our bedrooms in the dark. So it was almost like going back to that again and so much fun. In 2011, I originated the role of Papageno with Stephen Mills. The process went really, really fast. Uh, he had a good idea of the narrative that he wanted to show to the audience. He had really narrowed it down to some of the finer points, and so it was an easy process. We knew going into each section what he was trying to accomplish. Because it is still based in a classical vocabulary, the teaching of the steps and what he wanted to create went very quickly because there's names for everything. So he could say, can you do this, can you do that? And so we could respond really quickly. Working with Steven in a collaborative process was really interesting because I feel like he pulled a lot of our personalities out into these characters. I think is one of Steven's really strong points is comedy and musical timing, especially in comedy. The collaboration went back and forth and that he would allow us to sort of suggest <laughs> poses or jokes and then sort of use that as a springboard to then bounce off and make ideas from, or vice versa, give us an idea of what he wanted to do and then say, what can you do with it? And since we've done it before, you're actually able to look at production videos and photographs and then be able to sort of pick it apart and try to find different ways to improve. Now I'm getting the opportunity to sort of amp it up another 10, 20, 100% and hopefully get all the laughs I want. I think people wonder why I would, as a choreographer, approach a work such as The Magic Fleet. It was made for the opera and it was made for the voice. But I, I sort of approached it selfishly because there's so much amazing music that I don't want to restrict myself from because the story is so much fun, the music is beautiful, and Mozart is some of the most danceable music. It's some of the most joyful music you would ever want to hear. It's just happy, happy music.